ಯಶ್ಚಂದಸಾಷಭೋ ವಿಶ್ವೂ ಛಂದೋಭ್ಯೋಧ್ಯಮೃತ ಸಂಭೂವ ಸಮೇಂದ್ರೋ ಮೇಧಯ ಸ್ಪೃಣೋತು ಅಮೃತ ದೇವಧಾರಣೋ ಭೂಯಾಸ ಶರೀರ ಮೇ ವಿಚರ್ಷಣ ಜಿಹ್ವಾ ಮೇ ಮಧುಮತ್ತ ಕರ್ಣ ಆಭ್ಯಾಂಭೂರಿ ವಿಶ್ರುವ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣ ಕೋಶೋಸಿ ಮೇಧಯ ಪಿಹಿತ ಶ್ರುತ ಮೇ ಗೋಪಾಯ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಎವ್ರಿಬಡಿ less than 2 years ago we started these webinars under the upanishad project exactly in this house in new jersey dr sid gautam motivated us inspired us to start this program he was with us that day and here at the residence of his daughter in colds neck new jersey i am indeed very happy to do the webinar as i said almost 2 years after that as you know this is the 82nd webinar and we have been doing every sunday a webinar by some speaker or the other and today we have a very fascinating topic that is is vedanta mere theory i would say about this topic on one hand there is quite a lot of common sense that uh, goes with this topic or the answer to this question on the other there is really mind boggling and profound dimensions to this very topic to this very question let's take the common sense first vedanta basically is gnanam its knowledge its a new understanding its seeing it's not about doing anything it's not about going anywhere it's not about becoming somebody but it's about recognizing a truth which always has been which always is and always will be it's about seeing properly so what is the common sense that goes with this issue is vedanta a mere theory now i'll come to that take the example of the well known humorous story of the lost 10th man most of you know but even if there is one among you who doesn't know the story of the 10th man i'll quickly mention what it is 10 people who are all rather foolish very low in iq crossed the river and then just to be sure that all the 10 had crossed the river they stood and uh, everybody tried to count are there all the 10 and everybody would count the remaining 9 leaving himself out and then lament oh we are only 9 where is the 10th guy where did he go and they jump to the conclusion the 10th man is dead and they cry in one of the versions of the story they are all disciples of a guru and there it goes everyone feels terribly guilty what will our guru say to us now you irresponsible boys you went on a mission and now only nine of you are returning so everybody imagined that one of them had died they had not counted properly everybody counted the other nine leaving out himself now with this as the illustration on which we can have hours and hours of vedantic elaboration but i will not go into that today our point is 
the place of knowledge in contrast to certain thing to be done. <clears throat> knowledge is knowing and things to be done means action. In technical terms, we say jnana versus karma. In this case of the tenth man apparently dead and gone, all that these ten people need is just knowledge. It's not by going anywhere, it's not by earning wealth, it's not by getting popular, it's not by building new relationships, not by building a new empire or anything of that kind that their sorrow can go. Their sorrow will disappear if they realize that we were mistaken. The tenth man is not dead. Among us, everyone is the tenth man if you count the others nine first. So please see, in life, there are surely a million things where we need to roll up our sleeves and act. We do not deny. There are a million things where karma, action is the answer. But there are a few things, like in the 10th man story, it is a simple scenario. There are many others like that, lots of such cases. For example, somebody doesn't know how much money is in his bank account by mere confusion or ignorance if she thinks that I have gone bankrupt, I don't have any money now, I am on the streets, I am in great danger. All she needs is to know, oh, I had forgotten about the other account I have. My Bank of India uh, is empty or Bank of America has no balance. But what about State Bank account? What about Wells Fargo account? What about some other account? I totally forgotten. In that account, I have plenty of money or somewhere else. So just the knowledge that I do have money in another place, but I have forgotten, makes the sorrow disappear. <clears throat> in fact, it can be said that in a number of situations in life, where we are operating in the field of desire, action is needed to fulfill that desire. Whereas there is a plane where we are operating in ignorance. When the problem is ignorance, it is not some activity to fulfill a desire, but it is right knowing that eliminates the problem. So common sense goes to say that it is wrong to imagine that anything and everything can be solved by action only, by effort only, by working hard, by, as the old idiom goes, burning midnight oil. It is wrong to imagine that everywhere it is by running faster and so on. Wisdom has undoubtedly a place in human life to bring us peace, to bring us happiness. Was it not Abraham Maslow who had humorously commented, a man who is good with the hammer thinks of every problem as a nail. So, people who are attached to action, people who have got addicted to work, do they call them workaholics? They imagine that always we should be up and running with due respect to the dynamism, to the action-oriented nature, where some of us are weak, in fact, we do need action sometimes. In the matter of ending sorrow, and on a very fundamental level, Vedanta uncompromisingly says, you need right knowledge. Samyak Darshana. Adi Shankaracharya was especially found, fond of an expression, Samyak Darshana. Samyag means rightly. Darshana means seeing. If you see rightly, then your fundamental problem is gone. This ignorance of oneself, I am incomplete, I am not okay, my life has been a failure, I have no friends, or what you in psychology call low self-esteem, 
low self worth notion of uh, worthlessness etc that can be ended by vedanta then of course once you come to understand i am okay then you can do the best possible in the domain of uh, you know uh, means and ends there are lots of things where for certain end you need certain means we do not deny the relative world but the tragedy all along in human history and even now at our time with uh, with us with humanity is by and large the overwhelming majority i should say operate in life out of an endless insecurity no matter how much wealth they have gained no matter how much fame and name they have received or no matter applying uh, the matter even to somebody like me how much study we have done how much scriptures we have studied gita upanishad ashtavakra gita yoga vasishta all we study but there seems to be a endless problem of a notion about oneself i am not yet there i am not okay i have many miles to go if you think about it it seems to us that uh, we have fallen in love with this sense of incompleteness if somebody were to say to us you are okay you know we get angry with them who are you to say we are okay we seem to regard it our birthright like somewhere once some somebody said a friend said to him don't cry and this fellow got angry who are you to say don't cry to cry is my birthright so you have fallen in love with crying you have fallen in love with your own idea of who you are that seems to be the case in fact on a serious note we do get very attached to grooves of thinking we do get very obsessed do we do get very caught up in one way of thinking and vedanta points out that this attachment to a thought in this case a wrong thought can happen and has happened on a very fundamental level before i go to certain profound dimensions of this matter i would hasten to add how sri ramana maharshi in his teachings all along emphasized the query who am i nan yar mai kaun hu who am i maharshi ramana highlighted it the basis of that is obviously all of us are in the grip of a certain idea of who we are we are not talking in physical terms if somebody who is 5 feet 8 inches tall has the idea day and night i am 5 feet 8 inches tall that's not wrong the body is of that height but we are talking of what we call the psychological domain the psychological domain comes to certain judgments about oneself about one's worth based on various factors and that judgment is very questionable take for example this height if the 5 feet 8 inches tall person on some influence imagines he is the best guy in the town or on by virtue of some other influences imagines i am so short there are all six footers in this town i am nowhere now 5 feet 8 inches is a fact of the body's height but i am good because of that or i am no good sweeping judgments that too not just in context of some basketball or some where some area where good height may be a advantage but in a sweeping generalization he is a big error now maharshi ramana's question applies in all these cases if somebody by virtue of his height or her wealth 
etc. imagines I am no good, Maharshi would ask, Who are you? Which means, you should question your notion of who you are deeper, not just get stuck with some notion. If you judge your worth only on the basis of wealth or only on the basis of height or some other qualification or color of the skin or whatever, we human beings have all along given great importance to a thousand factors while really speaking out of spiritual wisdom those factors at the at the best have a little place somewhere they are a drop in the bucket height or weight health or wealth fame or uh, not being well known all these are a drop in the bucket the real i these mystics these saints these vedanta teachers would say to us the real i is way beyond not just one or two judgments about who we are you lump all the judgments together make a list of 200 ideas you have about yourself going by as i said each of those factors going by knowledge of language i am poor but going by knowledge of music i am good by height i am good but weight i am not good by looks i am good but but like that, you know, so many. I studied in a famous college, but nowadays I don't have enough skills. And here is this other friend who studied in an ordinary college, but he is so skillful, he has good reputation in the profession. This is what I mean by factors. So make a list of 200 factors and make a judgment. I am good, I am not good. Ramana Maharshi would say, now take all of them together and Put it in front of yourself. Ask yourself, who am I really? You will be able to dismiss all of them. Or at best, as we use the idiom, all of them together is a drop in the bucket. So who am I is very seminal, very central to this awakening process. If you and I can have a little vairagya, Vairagya is the main need for who am I inquiry. You, you know, members of audience or even speakers like me who may know a lot. Finally, if we don't have enough Vairagya, when we are in the Vedanta class, we appreciate all this. But afterwards, we have thousand things of the world to talk about, to worry about, to think about. We always then say, a little more wealth and then I'm going to come back to who am I inquiry very seriously. A little more fame, a little more of fun and little more of enjoyment. Just another few years. Thereafter, like this we have been doing. I'm not asking any of you to stop immediately anything. Ultimately, it should all come from your own within. Or in Bhakti Marga, we say it is divine grace. When God showers his grace upon us, overnight we can change to be focused on self-inquiry. Otherwise, in spite of an enormous amount of Shastra Jnana, we would again be primarily concerned with uh, something egoistic and put this uh, self-inquiry, self-knowledge to the back seat. Now let me come to a second dimension which is more philosophical, which I will try to express in as simple a language as possible. That is where I would bring a little of the wonderful commentaries written by Sri Adi Shankaracharya. Adi Shankaracharya, the great champion of Advaita Vedanta, is, I should say, ruthless when it comes to a certain issue that was uh, a major issue during his time more than buddhism or jainism or some other isms adi shankara when we see his life had to deal with what is called karma kanda his main opponents were not buddhists or jains or others adi shankara's opponents when he went around 
those who engaged him in very hard arguments were the ritualists. You know, Mandana Mishra, who of course lost in his debate and then became the foremost disciple of Adi Shankara. Mandana Mishra became Sureshwar Acharya. He was the first pontiff of Shangeri Mata. So, like uh, Mandana Mishra, there were a number of Vedic scholars in the in India, who, all of whom believed that Vedas primarily teach us to do the Yajna, Yaga, Homa, Havana, to be very regular in our Anushtanas, in our Karmas, and there is nothing beyond them. So their focus was on Karma. Their focus was on doing. Be hardworking, be on your toes, follow the rules that are given in the Vedas to the finest detail, and there is nothing beyond Karma. Karma and Upasana you can you know, uh, put together. Whereas Adi Shankara said, Karma definitely helps to purify the mind. It is all right to uh, prepare ourselves. Just as in Atma Bodha, Shankara gives a simple example how in order to prepare some food, you actually need fire, you prepare the food, you cook the food and you eat. Swami Chinmayananda used to describe it elaborately and quite humorously. Somebody came and cut the vegetables and brought, brought other material and finally had put it on a vessel also but forgot to turn the gas on and waiting and waiting. The food is not ready. No, don't stretch the example, don't say you eat raw food and so on. <laughs> In the case of a standard meal, you know, we would eat the meal when it is well cooked. So examples have their limitations. The idea is, in Atma Bodha, you have a line. Pākasya vannivat jnānam vina mokṣo na siddhyati. Mokṣaha jnānam vina na siddhyati. How, how come liberation is not possible unless you have right knowledge? Vanni, uh, uh, vannim vina yatha pākaha na siddhyati. Pāka is cooking. For cooking, what, what is most important is you need fire. Likewise, for gaining this liberation, moksha, you need knowledge. So, what is the profound side of it? Sri Shankaracharya, in his commentaries, says that there is an ignorance, there is a false notion of who we are. And what makes it profound is, the moment this notion, I am this body, I am this personality. I have such strong strengths, such weaknesses. I have such positive points and such negative points. I have these limitations, but those advantages. Hundred ways. I already dwelt on it a while ago. How we describe ourselves. How we describe materially or sometimes even spiritually. Suppose a upasaka a person who worships God, thinks of himself, I have been worshipping Mother Lalita, I am a Devi Upasaka, I have come up to this level, I have so much more to go. That is also a description. Or a Vedanta teacher like me, suppose, imagines, I have studied well and now a lot of people appreciate my lectures, etc. But I have a long way to go. Whatever way you describe yourself, spiritually or materially, then Adi Shankara would say, in basic terminology, you remain a karta and a bhokta. You are a doer and you are an enjoyer. Whereas your true nature, which is satchit, existence awareness, is never a doer. All the karmas, I said before, karmakandis, Ritualists who talk about so many complicated Vedic rituals. All the rituals, however wonderful they may be, they may take you to heaven, 
and they may give you a long stay in heaven because of a large amount of punya that you may earn finally come to an end because karma on one hand is finite however large it may be the finite cannot bring you the infinite whereas jnana is something that by itself is not finite right seeing samyak darshana what it does is the doer in you is exposed to be a mere imagination doer i am a doer i do this i get that if i do that i get something else so all karma have a primary uh, basis of our taking ourselves to be the doer just as in our dream if we imagine ourselves to be let's say a poor man in need of uh, food i'm very hungry in my dream i'm looking around where i may get some food and then half of the dream i may wake up and then i may laugh i had such a hearty meal and i slept off in the dream see on one level the search for food or going or looking around where to go and maybe already started moving towards a place where there is food that is action so looking for place of food moving towards the place of food all this was going on but on other another level in the dream there was this error of uh, false self conception how you saw yourself when you wake up please see this when you wake up it's not a matter of you found the place of food it's not that you covered the distance that you had to go to get food rather you discovered that you are not hungry at all you are all right so thought created the sense of limited i shankara would say many things about the uniqueness of jnana if you read his bhashya on the upanishads for example in uh, a place at uh, at a mantra in mundaka upanishad he makes a startling statement in fact it's very mind boggling adi shankara says i am expressing in simple english here i am not quoting the actual original sanskrit uh, lines but he says the uniqueness of this atma jnana please note we are not talking of knowledge of some objects but knowledge of oneself knowledge of the pure self that you are because this word self is used on various levels when we say self confidence there the word self is used in a rather ordinary sense we are talking of the pure self and in the vedanta literature the pure self is referred many times to uh, referred to many time as self with an upper case s so we are talking of that self with an upper case s that is the shuddha atma i must hasten to add even when somebody dies we talk of an atma that goes from one body to another that is also not shuddha atma that is called jiva atma that is called samsari atma this has led to a lot of confusion in students uh, who have not really gone into it in proper detail just as the word new york can stand for the city of new york or the state of new york the word atma in a number of contexts like punarjanma and so on refers to what we may technically in english call conditioned self adi shankara is now talking about the pure self unconditioned unconditioned true nature so in mundaka bhashya at a certain place he says when you have an insight of ah yes i am this pure awareness alone i am this pure existence awareness alone a wonder of wonders happens and that is instantly upon the dawn of that knowledge you not only know who you are the 
the triputi we call it the threefold division of there being a knower there being something that is known and there being the process of knowing triputi the threefold division is like that the subject who knows the object that is known and the subject and object coming in contact you know sometimes you may be sitting before a television you are watching television so you are the subject television is watched that is the object but if your mind wanders then you don't know what is going on there so there is need for the knower and the known to come in contact right likewise all the karmas that is this business of doing whether you and i work in some mundane field earning money and uh, getting things done or those karma kandis like mandana mishra and so on who are performing the vedic rituals whether it is we use the two words laukika or vaidika laukika karma or vaidika karma laukika means mundane matters today our generation is known for going headlong into so much of science and technology today of course there are other fields too but typically lot of bright people go for some fields of discipline engineering medicine and such fields so that is all laukika that is all in the world so we handle men money and matters we may handle machines we may build brighter machine you know more intelligent machines um, for example google is coming out uh, earlier apple steve jobs was coming out with uh, yet newer gadgets other day sundar pichai was in a short video that went around something called google lens is coming so you just hold the mobile i suppose or an instrument to a distant object maybe just a, a flower right away you know what flower it is what its botanical name is what medicinal properties it may have and under things all about the flower just by pointing your mobile or some special instrument to the flower now this is a laukika karma this is a laukika karma whereas a vaidika karma could be to give a simple example you go to tirupati balaji venkateshwara and you fold your hands and you sing uh, some shloka let's uh, say vishnu shloka and as you are uh, contemplating suppose you think of yourself as a dasa as a devotee you say a shloka and you think of yourself as a devotee lord is the master you are the uh, follower you are his servant and so on and so forth shankara would say that is also karma in fact it it can be called upasana karma upasana together broadly they are a field where the division continues to be lord venkateshwara whom you are adoring and you the bhakta or devotee there is a division and your thought process does not eliminate that division the thought process rather strengthens you are being the you know dasa and he being the prabhu shankara would say this atma jnana eliminates the division between uh, the object and the subject so doership goes away and any description of you are being somebody in contrast or in relation to someone else that goes away so in sanskrit we say the knower is pramata pramata means one who knows the thing to be known is prameya what is to be known and the instrument of knowledge is pramana or knowing is prama so there is pramata prameya pramana prama these are components of knowledge these are various components of the process of knowing and that's what i called mind boggling 
He says there is an awakening where you find that these divisions just disappear. Just as when you wake up from dream, in the dream you perhaps was the soccer player, there were other soccer players, there were one or two umpires also running on the field, there were so many spectators and thus there were so many components. You are kicking the soccer ball, there is the ball, there you are kicking. Upon waking up, isn't it true that that whole plurality goes away, you just find yourself alone on the bed. Again, with some limitations of the dream example, the examples are only to facilitate a rough grasp of what change, what transformation takes place. Now comes the central question we had taken up. Is Vedanta a mere theory? If the liberation were possible by going somewhere, if liberation involved becoming somebody, if liberation involved gaining some powers, powers of reading somebody's mind, powers of becoming very small or becoming very big, you know, those Siddhis you have heard of, Anima, you become very small. It is said Hanuman, when he went to Lanka, became so tiny and flew around. Mahima, same Hanuman could become huge also. Then Lagima, without your volume or size changing, you become very light. So the Shastras have talked about all these Siddhis. But liberation is not gained by any of these Siddhis. So is Vedanta mere theory? We would say, if the knowledge that is required for liberation involved some of the siddhis, some power, reaching somewhere, getting something, collecting something, then yes, Vedanta would have been theory and to do all those things you needed some action. Because when we say theory, uh, the context is uh, this is the theory, you you understand it, then these are the things you need to do. There is something to do later on. But in a rather thought-provoking style, the wisdom of Vedanta says to us, in the context of Atma Jnana, if you know what it is, then there is not an iota of anything to be done. Karma Shesha. Shesha means what remains, karma, to do. There is nothing that needs to be done. No Vedanta discourse generally is complete without bringing the example of rope and snake. So, when you mistake a rope for a snake and you are very frightened and you are calling for help, you are thinking of getting a, maybe a stick and beating that snake, whatever. When you gain right knowledge, which happens through just a beam of light, you take a flashlight, turn it on, then you see, oh, this is not a snake at all. It's just a rope, which I mistook to be a snake. Now, can we say, now that you know it is not a snake, uh, you don't have to bring a long stick, a small stick would do. There's no stick needed. You don't need to run far away, but just, just to be on the safer side, run 10, 10 feet away. You don't have to run at all. You don't have to run. You don't have to get a stick. You don't have to call for help. You don't need to do anything at all. You are just free in this context. It is not a snake, it's a rope. Just like that, when self-knowledge dawns on you, the Vedanta says there is no need to do anything. In the synopsis we sent with the invitation to the webinar, we had written that there are some people who, who go to the extent of saying Vedanta is theory, then yoga is the practice. This is a very huge misconception. If you really ask me, then what is the place of yoga? Do, do you also do yoga? Don't you do yoga? Well, I myself do yoga. I do some Surya Namaskar, some Pranayama. I believe in keeping fit. Then, 
if you are a Vedantin and Vedanta is giving you everything, why do you do all this? <laughs> Let us clarify on that. With Vedanta, you get a, a different outlook on the deep level of your identity, who you are. If you are feeling low because of less wealth or less knowledge or less fame or less something or ill health, Vedanta eliminates that. That judgment, I am not good, that judgment it eliminates. Now yoga or walking or right food or right sleep, that is for the operational level, that is not about the basic sense of inner freedom. As we already said, there are people who are very fit, but they are not free deep inside. They have their own insecurity. There are people who have got Nobel Prize, very knowledgeable, but they have their own complaints to make if you meet them very privately. They will say that though I am a Nobel Prize winner, I am not respected enough in some circles and so on. Those who are famous, those who are accomplished, deep inside them are many times we find not free. So yoga does two things. One is when Vedanta can bestow upon you a sense of total freedom, if you understand it rightly, yoga can help you do a few, quite a few things because your equipment, body is like an equipment that will be in good shape to do things. So yoga and Vedanta are not opposed to each other. But the error would be to look at yoga as a sequel to Vedanta. It is not a sequel. Vedanta takes care of the fundamental problem and yoga can facilitate a problem or a, it can facilitate an operation on a secondary level. It's like you enjoy very good health, that is one level, and suppose you know French, you can travel in France and talk to people in French. So being able to talk to people in France as you are traveling to various cities of France and knowing French. You know, that is on a very different level. Another person who doesn't know French goes to France, goes to some in interior towns and is very inconvenienced. He doesn't know the language. So, to know French facilitates a kind of operation in a certain field. Likewise, keeping fit having wealth, having some good contacts, facilitates a lot of things. But what if primarily you feel inadequate? If you feel something is missing. You feel, you know, above all, you feel you're going to die. Oh, I'm not going to live for long and so on. Or you are sor 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 sorrowful that uh, some death has taken place in you, among your near and dear ones. These will not go by mere yoga. Yoga can at the best calm your mind. But Vedanta can eliminate the most primary notion in you. So another dimension of yoga could be, I would say Vedanta can be taken up following some yoga. When your body and mind are reasonably in good shape, you will be able to study the Vedanta properly. So to an extent, I would not attach too much importance to that fitness, but to an extent, as far as possible, if one is as fit as possible, then one can, because even if you want to listen to a Vedanta discourse for a whole hour, you need stamina, you need uh, a certain energy, and yoga can help. But in the fundamental business, let me call it the fundamental business of getting free, getting liberated uh, with the help of right insight, yoga has no role to play. Yoga is also one form of karma. Yoga also is form of upasana. Adi Shankara would uncompromisingly say, and that is what needs to be understood. This one webinar may not be enough really to throw all the light on it. But let me give you the basic uh, idea. Uh, 
uncompromisingly, Adi Shankara would say, this mysterious phenomenon of putting aside the erroneous notion about who we are and seeing or coming upon the right knowledge of who we are doesn't involve any karma, any upasana. Doesn't involve any breathing technique or any bending backward or bending forward. Therefore, in a rather witty manner, Swami Chinmayananda used to say, you have to take it in proper context and not mistake it. He used to say about yoga, I don't believe in bending my body. I believe in straightening my mind. It, this is not to be taken as an insult to the yoga, but it should be only taken as the importance of right seeing. Please don't look at it as, oh, so is he finding fault with yoga? <laughs> His own master Shivananda was so much into yoga. So there is no question of uh, mocking at yoga. But please see the first part. Sinmayananda said, uh, uh, the main part, I believe in straightening my mind. I don't believe in bending my body. So the bending my body, uh, reference to yoga, uh, is uh, secondary there. Straightening the mind. So let me conclude this presentation saying, uh, going by the uh, Shankara Siddhanta, the tradition of Adi Shankara, which is very, very appealing logically to a lot of us, we would maintain that there is a certain discipline of uh, right seeing, right knowing, and this right knowing, right seeing can set us free in the core of our being. And this getting free at the core of our being uh, is not just theory, it is complete in itself. If we were to say it is mere theory, then it means it is incomplete. You need to do something after that, following that. You know. Here, because of the unique nature of the problem, the matter is totally different. The unique nature of the problem is such that so much of fear or desire, anger, insecurity, all these have happened because we don't know who we are. That is the nature of the problem. And when we know who we are, rest of it becomes a play. A person who has right knowledge goes about his life as though he is playing with things, with uh, a lot of alertness, understanding. We don't mean by play uh, he becomes irresponsible. On the contrary, he is full of responsibility, compassion and so on, which come to him or her very, very naturally. All right. Thus we say Vedanta is not theory. It is a revelation which is complete in itself, leaving nothing else that needs to be done. Let me pause here and uh, as usual, we welcome questions or comments. Om Namo Narayanaya. Okay. Is there any hand raised? Let me see. Okay, Prasad Vepa has raised his hand. Let me first take Prasad's question. Yes. Haryom Swamiji. Haryom. Wonderful uh, talk as always. And uh, I will ask the question which I've asked you previously. <laughs> and maybe it's, it's also maybe a same question on other people's mind too. Uh, so if uh, self-knowledge instantly dispels ignorance, yeah. why, why is it that we uh, don't seem to remember that and we need uh, other things to do to kind of bring us back? 
So uh, that seems to imply that uh, there is continued uh, how, you know, need for not necessarily action, but some effort on our part to stay in that clarity. You know, uh, turning on the light in the room dispels the false image of the of the snake. Uh, but again and again, we seem to uh, lapse back and 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 fall into the ignorance. So uh, I know it's um, conditioning. And um, the great seers like uh, Ramana or uh, other seers stay in that. So how can we stay in, in knowledge? Um, I would look at it this way. It's not that they stay and we do not stay. Uh, in their case, right knowledge has happened. In our case, right knowledge has not happened. Yeah. Okay. Right knowledge has not happened, so it's not a matter of remembering. If right knowledge has happened, then that's it. There is no need to remember. Okay, so what we have gained so far is uh, a certain appreciation in a conceptual manner. So conceptual manner uh, has uh, two dimensions. One is there is some aesthetic uh, quality to the uh, to the statements or the uh, to the descriptions given in the Vedanta books. We appreciate the analogies. We appreciate the illustrations. We appreciate you know the stories. Tenth, tenth man story, for example, right? We enjoy that. The second dimension, which may be more serious. Are you able to hear me? Yes, sir, I can. I can hear you. Okay, because by by chance I touched the screen and uh, something changed here. Okay, I avoid touch sensitive screen. So uh, the second matter is, you know, uh, somebody is trying to stop a car. He is uh, putting his foot upon the brakes, but he finds the car is speeding up more. You know, then he realizes that his uh, another foot is pressing the gas pedal also okay like that you and I many times are studying the Vedanta and uh, we have a certain aesthetic appreciation we love it but meanwhile uh, knowingly or unknowingly there is a continuous agenda in us of uh, you know going after something in the world so that agenda, you know, of going after something in the world is like pressing the gas pedal. So this fellow is uh, no doubt pressing the brakes, but also pressing the gas pedal, right? Uh, like that, no doubt we are uh, getting near. We say, oh, how nicely it is said here, how nicely it is expressed here. But sometimes consciously or sometimes unconsciously, uh, the thought process in us is active. Uh, oh, you know, uh, I'm going to get the new car, I'm going to move into the bigger house, or even a scholar like me. You know, the next book I am publishing will definitely be a bestseller. It will be listed on New York Times bestsellers. So that kind of entertaining a desire, uh, or, you know, another part of our psyche, it keeps the doership very active. It keeps the doership very strong. Therefore, one has to study, continue to study, and I would summarily answer your question saying, if knowledge happens, then that's it. The goose is cooked. The matter is over. Thank you, Swami. That's a very helpful analogy to keep in mind that it's not only uh, is it instantaneous, but we should also uh, stop pressing the uh, accelerator. So I, I think uh, even though the knowledge is instantaneous, uh, our other actions kind of keep us chained to the uh, to, to the world of ignorance. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you, Swami. Uh, today with me there are eight or ten people here, right in the hall where I am speaking. Uh, so I'm asking them also if there is any question, please uh, do ask. Meanwhile, uh, those who are in the participants of the webinar online, they of course are welcome to raise their hand by, oh yes, uh, let me take one more question online, uh, Mr. Manmohan Pejawar from San Jose, I guess. 
Are you in the house here today? Okay, that doesn't matter. Okay, where is uh, Pejavarji? Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you for the lecture. One uh, thing about staying in that knowledge, for example, a lot of discussions happen on who am I inquiry, and then that knowledge of who you are changes. And in all of those cases, as far as I gather, though directly people refuse saying that in the sense that you realize ultimately the only imperishable part of your body is the Atman, which is the life force that you got when you came into this world. Mm -hmm. And that still remains after you exit this world. Now that is the true realization. So whatever happens, it is happens to your body. However, the problem of staying in that and not getting distracted is because of this pleasure and pain mm -hmm. the body goes through. Like mm -hmm. if somebody stabs a knife in you, the pain is very real and very uh, existential. And that has to be faced and overcome. Similarly, a fear of, say, execution, somebody to, is going to execute you tomorrow, that's the fear you have to overcome. Now, that is what makes staying in this awareness that hard because of the practical necessity of living. Isn't that the truth that, am I saying it correctly that though the knowledge is there that you are the only imperishable part, but you have to deal day to day, second to second on this pleasure and pain principle that is physical in nature from birth to death. So is that correct understanding and then you do the best of it if you have ill health when you're doing good, it is easy to bear all that because it is pleasurable. But it's the other side that brings you misery. Am I saying it correctly? Is that one of the problems that from this is everybody? Yeah, yeah. you have uh, raised a doubt which a lot of people have. Uh, there are um, two dimensions to what you have said. Like somebody may stab me tomorrow, I have to walk, go through some area which is notorious, let us say. And I have to, you know, go through the area at a wrong time also. So there is a fear. So you have raised the, this, this kind of example. Um, now the two dimensions are this. One is the actual. The actually, yes, you do go through such situations. Another is the what what is held uh, what is supported by thought you know um, a lot of our fears are based on what if one day i have to go through such an area what if one day somebody uh, does such things to me maybe i have seen someone else going through that so we brood a lot on possibilities I, you know, like it is one thing that everything is decided tomorrow I have to go through a bad area. Another is the thing is decided, but I read in the newspaper that someone got stabbed and then I, I start trembling. What if uh, one day I have to go? So somebody asks, do you have to go? No, no, right now I don't have to go, but someday I may have to go, you know, that kind of. Yeah. Now if you examine yeah, if you examine a large portion, 90% of our thoughts are all imagined fears. So a spiritual seeker should first uh, eliminate these imagined fears. If something really has come up, deal with it. Therefore, that is where vairagya comes in. Yes. And you and I don't have enough vairagya. We imagine a lot of problems and get nervous and then get very busy collecting uh, things or, you know. So if we can uh, reduce that, the promise of the Vedanta is, if you can reduce, you know, uh, thoughts based on mere imagination, you will have the energy to dwell on the self more. And then 
a certain inner transformation takes place. Yeah. With that inner transformation, if that kind of situation were to happen, you know, you would face it. You would face it in the best possible way and uh, that is not an issue. Where it can be avoided, you will avoid. Where it's unavoidable, you will go through it in the greatest dignity possible. That is the, yeah. Yeah, thank you Swamiji. I think wonderful that I think uh, supplies the missing link that I have uh, forgotten. <laughs> it is a 99% are imaginary fears, 1% yes. might be real even if that. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, that helps a lot. Any question here? You want something? I will repeat it if they same, don't. Same thing. Self effort, keep on at it, then give up. Right. Keep, keep working on yourself. Yeah. Uh, one of the participants sitting uh, in the same room where I am says that, uh, in other words, this is a matter of how we have to put in more self-effort. I call it Vairagya. She says it is self-effort. Yes, that is more Abhyasa. Abhyasa involves Vairagya. With more Abhyasa, uh, we become aware how we are ourselves contradicting our own uh, true intentions. So abhyasa is required. Abhyasa means spiritual practice. Take for example, uh, just the other day I was advising somebody who came to see me here. Uh, she was telling me about the importance of scriptural study, Upanishadic study and meditation. So I asked her that visitor two days back here only. So when do you do it? I miss it, she said. Every now and then I miss it. I want to regularly study, but I am not able to study. Then the point came up. Maybe it will be valuable to you. Can you try to do in the first four hours of the day? Many times you miss what you want to do because morning you think you will do it in the afternoon. Afternoon something comes up. So what they call in time management, first thing first. If we put first thing first, then we will go a long way. So in the Vyasa, this 99% will go away. Or reduce first and then go away. Uh, let me see, anyone else has raised the hand. I will scroll up and down. Haryam uh, Samir, is the Ranjan here? Yes. Do you, did you see any written question? Uh, no, I don't see, but I, I have a question here. I don't ask you. Okay, Ranjan, go ahead. Yeah, so um, we, we, had a, uh, we had a very nice talk from you again uh, this time. So it, it was very nice. Um, uh, there was another talk that we had last week by Jan Ranjan Dashish also, and there was a question raised. So I think uh, I would like to uh, you know, connect both this and ask that question about here, which I asked in the last one too. Um, uh, if you have jnana, then you'll be in, uh, you'll be uh, always happy, right? Yeah. Uh, about everything. So, um, and also the the, uh, the uh, um, I mean he um, uh, jnana last time he raised a thing which I have to remember that uh, Swami Chinmani said that happiness is uh, number of desires fulfilled divided by the number of desires that you have. So the yeah. the number of desires that you have, yeah. if is going to be zero. Uh, that you know, uh, it, it's very difficult to be uh, zero. But if it is zero, then I think I remember Swami Shivananda saying that uh, if it is zero, then you you are almost lifeless. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the uh, you know there has to be some action. There has to be some desire, right? So and then uh, the uh, so um, is, is is that true? I mean, is that what uh, Swami Shivananda said that you become lifeless if you don't have any desires and you know uh, and the happiness changes again? Yeah, therefore Swami Chinmayananji himself used to always clarify that what goes away is not desire per se, but selfish desires. So selfish desires can become zero. In the case of that enlightened person, there is no selfish desire because there is no limited self anymore in her. She uh, entertains desires which can... Uh, which can take the form of, you know, she sees various possibilities, she sees the uh, well-being of people, she gets involved in it. It's not for her personal security, she is okay. So if you add the adjective selfish desire, then the, that can become zero. 
because i want to become somebody i want to become famous i want to be like him or her so this i and my uh, that can be eliminated otherwise yeah you are right uh, action and uh, desire behind an action is the very signature of life only in the graveyard there is no desire no action till our last breath uh, you know it is the nature of life as long as we are alive we would see various possibilities hey this can be done will it not be nice for all of us to do this so that i gets replaced by all of us selfish desires go away that's how i guess saints and sages mystics even ramana maharshi would suddenly take a paper and pen and uh, do a translation of let us say atma bodha in tamil so see if uh, if a scholar uh, you know would do that the scholar would imagine ah oh, now i am doing a translation this will sell very well i will become more popular this that is what i need now that is selfish desire there is an insecurity in the scholar but the enlightened mystic makes a translation or writes a book uh, he he or she doesn't entertain a thought of this book will bring me some fulfillment it's rather sharing the happiness sharing the joy you see a beautiful rainbow and you just call your wife hey, come come see this this is so beautiful it's not with any agenda in mind you just share the joy of seeing this rainbow with your wife or children or friends like that the the absence of selfish desire so if uh, to conclude this as you call your wife to say, saying come come see this rainbow how, how beautiful it is uh, there is no selfish desire there uh, uh, though there is a desire you know if somebody asks why did you call your wife you say i desire that she also uh, take the uh, benefit so it, technically it's a desire but there is no promotion of the self Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it was very nice. Thank you. Any other question? Looks like there are no other questions. Let me one last time scroll the names. Uh, yeah, there is no other question. Yeah. So let's all uh, study uh, with more alertness because there are hidden. Uh, intentions or we, the mind entertains some secret identification you know like a vedanta scholar once told me i have increased the, i am studying vedanta more rigorously but then he admitted you know and he admitted that by rigorously studying finally i think other scholars will accept me who i am okay eh? so his rigorous study was meant to consolidate his position as a well received well accepted vedanta scholar i mean that's a good desire we, we don't say it's very bad it's not that he is <laughs> he said there's anything anti social about it but in the context of liberation uh, he is yet to you know mature because rather than realizing god or brahman he wants to be a well received vedanta scholar in maybe the whole world he wants some famous university to invite him to talk on vedanta so that's a good desire <laughs> but it is you know it is uh, not in the context of what we are talking this enlightenment uh, one, one doesn't plan for one's own promotion an enlightened an enlightened person also may go to some university and speak he may give a lecture on some very reputed uh, platform he may deliver a vedanta talk in some famous what is that royal albert hall in england <laughs> but then uh, he won't he or she you know won't entertain a sense of ah now i am you know what i always wanted to be ha ha you know that is not possible because she has reached a state of inner fulfillment and royal albert hall or some small ganpati temple in some village in india will not make difference to him it is rather the joy of sharing the wisdom and not about oneself becoming a famous popular uh, or somebody taking note of who you are now etc so okay um uh, i think there's one more uh, one question here by vijayalakshmi bangera but I, i don't think it's complete uh, there um 
Oh. Uh, they have to raise a hand. I don't know whether she knows that. Uh, Correct. I see a question mark, but not the hand symbol. And also, it says she is offline, so she has maybe disconnected already. Oh. Anyway, she is welcome to send it by email too to our email address. So let's conclude. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om